Jesus' most memorable miracles was feeding thousands of people in need of food. A church in Kansas City in the middle of the United States has been following Jesus' example of feeding the multitudes. So far this year, we've served about 13,500 families. That equates to about 53,000 people when you add up the people in those families. The New Haven Church opens its parking lot every Tuesday for food distribution. Cars line the street and wrap around the church to wait for the volunteers to fill the back of the cars with groceries and even baby supplies. All this is accomplished in partnership with other organizations in the community. They work together to help families in need. You know, from 10 to 11 for one hour we serve, um, you know, and we did probably about uh, 300 families today and uh, probably about 1,200 to 1,500 uh, clients that we served. I'd say we probably do anywhere from 80 to a little over $100 worth of groceries when they come through and we put it in the back of their trunks. Today is not just any other distribution day. The church is celebrating their one millionth pound of food donated for the year. Pastor Mark is thanking the team by grilling vegetarian burgers for them to enjoy. At the end of June, we hit one million pounds of food that we served, you know. Here in 2021, we're definitely on pace to do over two million pounds. So we just took a little time to celebrate that. We were thanking the volunteers that were there with some uh, vegetarian burgers with caramelized barbecue on it. And uh, so yeah, it was a good celebration just to thank the, the volunteers for all their work. We couldn't have done it without them. It's not only about the amount of food served, but more importantly, the lives they are able to impact. Another family said they were asking for prayer because they were going to be evicted from their home in a couple of weeks. It reminded me that we're serving people right that are really on the edge of homelessness. This food pantry in Kansas City has grown to serve many families each week, and they say their growth strategy is simple. The more we pray, the more people God brings here. And so I would say, if you want to start a pantry like this, start praying for every single person that comes through there. And as you pray for those people, God will send you more. He knows he needs prayer. And it will grow and grow and grow. But that is what has happened to us. From humble beginnings, this church has fed hundreds of thousands of people over the last few years. Please pray for the team in Kansas City, as well as others around the world, who are continually seeking ways to serve their communities with love. Good morning and welcome to Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Online at Vallejo Drive Church. My name is Ben Guerrero. I serve as one of the associate pastors here at the Vallejo Drive, and we're excited that you chose to join to study the book of Genesis with us today. We're following the Sabbath school lesson that you can find online simply by typing in those three words, Sabbath school lesson, and you'll see uh, quarterly it's called. You just click on that button. It pops up. It'll give you the date from the day we start studying until the day we end of that particular week. And then you can catch up if you like. If you didn't get a chance to study this week's lesson, you're in for a real treat because it surrounds the after flood moments with Noah, his sons, his family, and the people trying to build this big tower to reach God and how what God does, not only to frustrate them and their plans, but he does it to save them. So I'm really excited that we get a chance to look at at least a couple points that Dr. Jacques Ducan, the author of this quarter's lesson on Genesis, brings out for us today. So as we get started, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. God, as we look at your word, as we study Genesis and the story of Babel and those moments after the flood and what your plans were for humanity and how they veered from that, thank you, God, for your goodness and grace that brings us back to you and to your plans for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look at this study here, it's amazing how we as people can derail God's plans for our lives. Yes, we can. We can do that through disobedience, especially Adam and Eve at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
when they chose to follow their own inclinations and to choose to follow the fruit because the other chose it, as opposed to following God's way and trusting in His word. And so they derailed us with evil and all the descendants after them. And ever since then, each one of us humans have always been tempted at moments to go our own way, to do it our way. You know that song, I did it my way? Well, sometimes we take that to extremes when it comes to God. We know what God is calling us to do. We know He's commanded us as believers, but yet we still sometimes choose to go our own way. Through great wickedness, even humanity, in God's eyes, sinned so much that God brought a flood and only saved eight people in, in this big boat called an ark that had all these different samples of species of animals. And Noah was the only one found righteous. And seven people only responded to his 120 years of preaching before God opened up the waters from above and the waters from the fountains of the deep to flood the whole earth, to cleanse it, to start anew, if you will, but he didn't just start anew with the earth. He actually retained humanity from before as a continuity of the humanity he came to save. So today we live with the counsel of God's holy word, the Bible in our homes. But are we living with the Bible in our hearts? Or are we going our own ways? And even though Noah was a righteous man, even though he and his family were spared the destruction of the flood, even Noah that we're going to see here in God's word, broke faith with God and went his own way and let himself go. So this week's study is called All Nations in Babel, and it's going to show us how God can take a human train wreck and bring blessings out of it and restore that train and get it back on track. And that's our hope for us today. So let's take a look at the lesson. I like what Dr. Jacques Ducan in this slide you're going to see on the screen says, In the end... In spite of human wickedness, God turns evil into good. He has, as always, the last word. And this is a theme for us this week. God has the last word. We can make a mess of things. We can derail God's desired plans for us, but He can always bring us back on track if we submit, if we come back, if we choose to repent and let God turn our hearts around. And that's the exciting thing about our God. He wants to turn our lives around. I don't know what area of your life you're struggling with that you want to have control, that you want to be able to, to form and shape according to your thoughts and your plans and your wills, even though God had decided, hey, this is the best way to do life in this area. I know I have my own personal struggles where sometimes I want God here and here and here in my life, but in other times I want to do it my way. And usually that comes for us as humans out of fear, that we're afraid it's not going to turn out as we hoped, or something is going to, there's going to be an X factor in there that's not going to really work for us. And so that's why we keep trying to hold on to things instead of just letting God work in our lives. So as history repeats itself, it's interesting to see what we call parallels. You know, when you studied in math, algebra, or geometry, or whatnot, we have parallels, right? Parallels are similar things, or often patterns we see between two or more things. So we're going to see parallels in this story. As Dr. Jacques Ducan points out, there's a parallel between Noah after the flood when he acts out by creating his own personal, portable, wine-producing machine. Whatever he used... To, to stomp those grapes and ferment the wine and whatever he did for that, he got himself drunk. And what's interesting is how this parallels, parallels Adam in the Garden of Eden. And these stories have two common elements. There are two fruits that are eaten in Adam's story and in Noah's story. And in those fruits, there's also resulting in a nakedness. As Adam and Eve realized they were naked when they ate the fruit, not that the fruit told them they were naked, not that the serpent said they were naked, but what was stripped away was their spiritual dignity, the, the cover of righteousness, the holiness that God had them enshrouded and covered. That's what they saw. They were still physically the same, but there was something missing spiritually. With Noah, he got himself drunk, and he, his dignity fell away, and his sense of righteousness and then there comes this covering, right? Adam and Eve ran into the forest and they found these leaves and tried to cover themselves in their own strength. 
we see a parallel to Noah's story where his, his son Ham sees him naked. Then he goes tells everybody about it. And then we see his brothers come in, walking backwards with a cloth. They did not want their father to be shamed. They covered him. Now that covering didn't absolve him of his sinfulness. But here what's interesting is with Noah, we see a connectedness of Noah to the roots of Adam. The sinful roots were unfortunately, we see a continuity of spiritual failure. You and I are part of that root of spiritual failure as well. And there's times when we have sinned, and there's times when that sin is exposed, like our nakedness, or when that sin reveals itself in, our, in the way we relate to people. Maybe we're so guilty about it, we feel shame about it, and we have not brought all that to God, that we keep acting out to people, or being upset, or on edge, or anger is just right underneath the surface, and people notice that. Well, what's interesting is, as Noah set up this portable wine, indulged himself, and there's that parallel we talked about. Um, with his son going around and telling his brothers, hey, our father's naked. Um, It's interesting how, although the brothers, we don't see them chastising him in this moment, by the fact that they walk in backwards, as Dr. Jacques Ducan points out, it's a silent chastisement of Ham spreading to others the fact that he was naked. And sometimes... We don't always need to verbally share or chastise people, although there are moments we need to call things out verbally to a person to help bring it to our, their attention the impact of their behavior. Sometimes us just doing the right thing can speak volumes for itself. Now, Dukan points out something here. He, he takes a look and says, look, at this is a form of not honoring one's parent as Ham did. And what's interesting is, although Ham is cursed, we also see his son Canaan is going to get a blessing. God, again, as we talked about before, God brings blessing out of our derailment, out of our moving ourselves out of God's will, even out of our causing train wrecks. He can bring us back on track, the very people he called to live on this earth. On the screen, we're going to show Exodus 20, verse 12, which says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And let's also look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. Although we see Ham dishonoring his father, we also see that God is going to bring a blessing even out of Ham's life through his children, Canaan. And Canaan, interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, as Jacques Dukan points out, means subdue. And that's the blessing God was going to give his people after they were going to be over 400 years of slaves in Egypt down the line. He was going to send them actually to go and eventually subdue the other nations in the land of Canaan. So God has blessings that we don't even know about or we don't know how he's going to bring them about for us even when we've messed up, even when we've chosen against him, even when we selfishly done and turned to our own ways. God is so good to us. We don't even deserve his kindness and goodness, yet he wants to bless us so much. So I have a a little challenge for you. Today, tomorrow, this week, or the next couple weeks, we know that the Ten Commandments were codified on the tablets that God gave Moses to give the children of Israel on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, which is going to come sometime later down the road. Um, But what's interesting is you can find stories or examples in Genesis that give examples of each of the Ten Commandments. Obviously, here's one where Ham did not honor his father, and he broke that commandment. But God's commandments stand the test of time, whether they're written on stone or whether they're written on our hearts. His laws in the universe govern with beneficence. It's a big word. With beneficence. Uh, our, our lives. So I invite you, here's a challenge. Where else in Genesis can you find examples of God's Ten Commandments, either being lived out or being broken? They may not be stated like they are in Exodus chapter 20, but it is kind of a fun exercise to do, and an interesting one for that. So the first point was history repeats itself, like with Adam and Eve, so with the wicked people until God brought a flood and destroyed them, but he preserved Noah and his family. But we still see Noah repeating history again, turning to his own self-centeredness, his own selfishness that brought hurt and ruin on others. 
So God still brings His grace, His goodness into those stories. That's our first point in today's lesson, as Dr. Jacques Ducan points out. The second point we're going to take a look at is the one language at Babel. So when you think of this, the whole world as described there in Genesis, it's interesting. There's going to be a different number of people, a way smaller number of people called the whole world at that time after the flood because there weren't many people. It started with eight and slowly started multiplying, right? Not compared to the many people that were there before the flood waters came. This group, the whole world, had a desire. And that desire is stated in the verse we're going to show you now in Genesis 11:4, which says, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. What's interesting is they have a desire. There's twofold. One, they're desiring to build this tower and that the top of it would go all the way up into heaven. That was their goal. That was the intention of their hearts. And the second thing is that they themselves wanted to do so not only to make a name for themselves, they wanted glory for themselves, but they also did not want to be scattered all abroad the earth. They wanted to be unified. They wanted to be in one geographical location. Well, what's interesting is that their desire, their design flies in the face of God's command to them as we look at Genesis 9.1. So God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Here's another parallel. As God told Adam and Eve, right, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, so he repeats in this, in this way, this, this type of a new world that has been created as God's flood washed away the evil and wickedness, in a sense, and brought forth new vegetation and new opportunities and a cleansing. Here, God is sending Noah and all his progeny out to say, be fruitful, multiply, and, and go and fill the earth. That means they're not to be stuck in one place, but to fill it, to explore it. And yet here they are defying God by gathering together and staying stuck and also building a tower to go up into heaven to make a name for themselves. Do you hear something there? It smacks of a character in the Bible called Satan. And Satan was in a beautiful, angelic being in heaven that served God, served the angels. But at some point in his heart of hearts, he wanted to ascend above God. He wanted to receive the worship of God. As the book Ezekiel and Isaiah tells us, he wanted to receive that worship. He wanted to be have his throne above God's throne. No one can do that. We're not designed for that. We might want it, but that's not what we're made for. So what's interesting is that these people had the spirit of Satan in them because they were concerned with their own worship, their own name, their own reputation, instead of accomplishing God's verbally expressed will. And what's interesting, another parallel Jacques Ducan points out is the fact that they said, let us make, right? Let us make this tower. Let us do this. Well, there's, that's an echo. And an echo is kind of a sound in the Bible that it's echoing something that was said that was similar, an idea or a theme that was said before somewhere. And where have we heard, let us make? Well, we heard that in Genesis chapter 1, where God says to them, and, and he says, hey, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So God made them in that way. So when God said, let us make, it's an echo. And the people are basically what Dr. Khan is, is sharing with us. It says, Noah's descendants were using that phrase to make a name for themselves we're going to do this for ourselves. We're going to be rely on ourselves. In essence, they want to build up and take the place of God. Again, we're back to the spirit of Satan at work inside of them. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, he's at work in the sons of disobedience. Whenever we disobey God, we are giving in to that same spirit. We're giving in to that same inclination. And that's part of our DNA. I can't explain it to you or myself biochemically how that looks. But it is a reality in our world today that we have this bent to relying on ourselves, to make a name for ourselves, to go our own way. Now, God doesn't tell me every morning which toothbrush to use or what kind of bread to use for my sandwiches I make for lunch, you know, or what clothes to put on each day. There's things that we do for ourselves. But when it comes to God's expressed will in the Bible, 
that he's that it was inspired by the Spirit among men to write for us and share with us what God's will is. We go against what God has expressed in that. We're living out the spirit of disobedience. And I've lived that out at different times. And I'm still tempted at times, just like you are. We all are tempted. And the question is, are we going to choose to rely on God's power and strength and grace to help us obey Him? Or are we going to rely on our own strength, our own feelings, our own thoughts, and just do whatever our inclinations tell us? Again, the story reminds us that God is at work. And God, interestingly enough, actually says, well, before we get to the point, let me just finish. So although God made a promise to the survivors that he would not send a flood like this again, the people still built that tall tower, presumably with the intent of surviving such a catastrophe if it would happen again. Again, we see another dimension of disobedience, and that is not taking God at his word, not believing what he says he will do or what he will not do. Even though God showed them with a beautiful rainbow, right? And said, this is my covenant. This, whenever you see the rains come and you see this rainbow, it's going to remind you of my words that although I brought a flood initially, I'm not going to bring a flood again on this earth. You don't have to worry about it. And that tells us that they're building this tower that they don't believe God's word. They were losing faith in him. Of course, the people would never succeed because they cannot go to God. But notice something very important that the lesson brings out for us this week. The people, as hard as they work, as, as high as they can build that tower, will never reach God, will never reach heaven. But notice, God said, let us go down. Look at Genesis eleven fifteen. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. God already saw the tower from his place in the universe in heaven. He did not have to come down and look at it. But what's interesting is, I'm going to plant a little seed for other Bible studies you're going to have in the future by yourself, in your small groups, in your church, or in the studies uh, online. God does investigate. This is another example of God doing an investigation. And that investigation is actually for our benefit. God didn't need to come down. He already saw what they were doing. But in the scriptures, we see God coming to meet us. God coming to where we are. God coming to take a look. And he does so in such an open, transparent way. We get to see the king of, of glory, the king of the universe, come and look and investigate what's going on. So God must come down to us since we do not have the power or ability to go to him. And this, my friends, is grace at work. God coming to us, even in our wickedness, is his grace. He's coming close to us. He's coming to take a look. He's coming to see what's going on. And we see him coming down to take a look and see what's going on. And although that might fill some of us when we sin with dread and fear, it should also give us a sense of comfort, uh, comfort about the grace of God, that He still wants to draw near to us. He still wants to bring us, the train of our hearts, back onto the tracks of His Spirit that will lead us into living out His will for our lives. God will have to come down and meet us to save us and to move us forward in His grace. So how does God save the people there at the Tower of Babel? Does He come and, bink, knock over the tall tower that they're trying to build? Does he come and, like Jenga, take one of the bricks out of the tower and then the whole thing comes down? No, he simply does something. As they're trying to unify and gather together, he does something very unique and creative. He says, you know what? These people have one language and there's nothing they can't accomplish if they accomplish this. Therefore, I'm going to confuse their communication. They're not going to be able to say, hey, bring me such and such a tool, or hey, we got to cut this stone with such and such a measurements, or hey, we need to gather all of you to lift up the structure. No, they were so confused with their language. I mean, have you traveled to another country and tried to speak someone's language? Okay. I've learned my, as best as I could to communicate, but sometimes there's miscommunication. Sometimes I said things wrong in Taiwan when I lived there that my friends would laugh because I said something totally different of a real thing, but it had, had nothing to do with what I wanted them to know. It's interesting that God used a language, created all these languages, to frustrate their plans, to help them not be in unity, but to be in disunity. Not to harm them, but to help them. Get back on track. What was God's command and his initiative for them in, in Genesis 9-1? That was to remember, to multiply and fill the earth. So God brought 
a confusion of languages, multiple languages to these group of people, so they will spread out, so they will go, because they're going to get frustrated enough to go to their own place with their own languages and start their own civilizations and begin to grow and, and do what God commanded them to do, which was fill the earth and multiply in it. So God had to come down and break up that party so they could wake up to their true condition and so they could walk in His commands, spread out and populate the earth. I want to wrap up with a couple things. One is this quote from Ellen White from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123. She writes, The schemes of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The, moment, the monument to their pride became the memorial of their folly. Yet men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon self and rejecting God's law. It is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that governed Cain in presenting his offering. Wow, this is a powerful quote that kind of encapsulates and summarizes our lesson for this week. That we are always tempted to go our own way. And those things that we did that often end in frustration or maybe pain or even, even worse, uh, fear and worry and anxiety that we do in life, it reminds us that we cannot depend on ourselves wholeheartedly, but to depend on God and to do what He's called us to do. Today, God shows us His grace in our self-centered living. When He comes down and frustrates certain plans of our lives or causes us confusion when we're trying to go our own way instead of following what God already expressed in His Word, God is doing this, derailing our evil self-centered intentions, not to hurt us, but to help us get back on track with Him. I love when I was a college student, I went to a Vespers one Friday night in one of the churches in Loma Linda, and they brought in a guest speaker. I'll never forget his face. His name was Pastor Mark. And this man uh, told us a story about his college days, and then he told us about seeking God's will and doing what God calls us to do. And he said this statement. He said, God sometimes muddies the waters so we can see him more clearly. And that's what he did at Babel. That's what he does sometimes in our life. He muddies the waters. We get confused, not to hurt us, but to help us look to him to bring clarity through the confusion, to get back to where God wants us to be. God is a God of grace, and he comes down and meets us where we're at because we cannot go up to where he is. And this is our God. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me a prayer. A prayer of thanks for God frustrating us. A prayer of thanks that sometimes He dissolves our self-centered schemes that we create. To give Him thanks that He restores us back to His will, back on track to living life with Him, with His joy, His strength, by His goodness and grace in our lives. So I invite you to pray with me now. God, thank you so much that you took the initiative to meet us where we are. Thank you for coming down and meeting Adam and Eve when they sinned against you to turn their evil to create goodness out of the evil that they created. Thank you for coming down to this earth where there was so much wickedness and violence on people's minds that you had to wipe out all the people except for a man and seven members of his household and choice species of animals and living things in a boat called an ark. And thank you, Lord, that even when Noah messed up, even when Ham uh, shared the shame of his father, even when people there at Babel try to unify and disobey your call to go out and to scatter among the earth and to multiply, that even though you came down, Lord, and confused their languages and frustrated them, you did so to save them so that they again would walk with you and walk with you in your will. I pray that you will do that for us today. And though it might hurt, I pray that we will receive it knowing that you love us knowing that you desire to be with us, and knowing that you want us to be with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray you have a blessed Sabbath day. At 11 o'clock, we have a special program today on April 30th, 2022, and that is our spring concert worship service. At 11 o'clock, you can find us on, on the different platforms, on YouTube. Facebook is a great place to go to hear the concert. And if you can join us live, we'd love to have you be with there with us. And at 4 o'clock today, at our sanctuary, we're going to show a pre-recorded, pre-recorded concert uh, from one of our very own, Marcus Desir, one of our young professionals, who is doing a, a choral recital. He's one of the students at USC, 
Uh, we have lots of, we're blessed with lots of young adults that are, are so talented. And we pray you'll either join us in person or you can watch online. It'll be streamed online as well, the same platforms. May you have a blessed day. May you go with God and may you walk in his will.